Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Lisa Jarrett, and I am one of the co-founders and co-directors of KS MOCA, or the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Museum of Contemporary Art. We are an art museum inside a public school, Dr. MLK Jr. School here in Northeast Portland, Oregon. And we work to connect students with contemporary art and uh, the associated careers. So you're joining us here for our 2021 Remote Artist Lecture Series and Artist in Residence Program. Uh, this morning, we will hear from Lucia Mohe, who Mo will introduce in just a moment. Um, but before doing so, I wanted to make sure to say hello to all of our Dr. MLK Jr. School students who are joining us live on the YouTube channel. If you all have questions, um, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to get them to Lucia at the end of her talk. I wanna give a huge warm thank you and shout out to the MLK Junior School principal, Jill Sage, to Paige Thomas, who helps facilitate and connect us with all the teachers at the school. Also Nancy Rios and Michelle Peek. Um, here with me this morning are Harold Fletcher, who is my co-founder and co-director of the project, also a professor at Portland State University, and Amanda Lee Evans, who is one of our primary collaborators on the KS MOCA project. We also have some students from Dr. MLK Junior School here this morning, and we want to make sure that you all know that they're with us, and hopefully you'll get to hear from them in the context of Lucia's talk. So Mo, would you like to tell us a little bit more about Lucia? Yes, but you... Oh, I think I did. I forgot. I wanted to make sure to thank Mr. Monty and to share out that we should exercise every day. Mo, take it away. Um, I can't hear you, Mo. Can you try, un try unplugging your headphones? Maybe just do it without the headphones. One second. Oh, I can now hear you. I can now, now hear can you. Hear you. Okay, your turn. Hi, everyone. I'm Mo. I go to Dr. Eh. Hi, I'm Mo, uh, and I'm introducing the artist Lucia Mohe. I am a student at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School, and I am also a part of KS Mocha as the head photographer. Today, we are going to hear Lucia's third lecture in this series. Congratulations. She is going to talk about her project Space Potato and Academy with Miss Bree's class. Whatever that means, it sounds cool. Lucia Mohe is a Peruvian artist who works, focuses on relationships between species and now lives in Portland with her family. Some of her recent projects include sending potato seeds into space like Neil Armstrong and Planton Movelle and walking forest performance to make better public green areas. Congratulations about that. That sounds awesome. Thank you for being here today. I can't wait, but I'm only going to be here for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mo. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's always so great to see you and get your energy. It's a great way to start. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mo. So I want to um, start by recognizing that I am speaking now from Portland, Oregon, which is a traditional and ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Timwater, and Watala bands of the Chinook, and the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations on the Columbia River. The project that I'm about to present is uh, part of, can you see my screen now? Correct? Yes. Great, thank you, Mo. The project that I'm about to present is part of an ongoing project with my collaborator, Xin Liu. And this project is called Unearthing Futures. And it asks the question of who gets to go to space and who even gets to imagine themselves going to space. Um, as part of that project, we sent uh, 75 potato seeds to the International Space Station, like Mo said before. Um, but in this year, yes. as a residency as uh, an artist in residence at KS MOCA, I've worked with fourth grade students, um, and I'm joined here today by Serena Turner, who's one of them. And we worked on a Space Potato Academy. Okay, so 
each of the first grade students received a booklet and a potato. And we spent five um, sessions working on how could we prepare these potatoes to go to space on a journey to a planet, a dwarf planet called Haumea. The first question that I asked um, as I met this group of students is, what do you know already about potatoes? And here are some of the answers. Potatoes grow underground and they can make potato chips and French fries. Um, there was an overall agreement that potato chips and French fries um, were very tasty. But then we went to learn a little bit more about potatoes. And Serena, who's here with me today, is going to share a little bit of the information. Serena, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Do I start reading now? Yes, please. That would be great. Okay. People in Peru were the first to cultivate potatoes. They started cultivating them around 10,000 years ago. They have found actual potatoes in ar archaeological sites in the ancient per Peruvians, even deprecated them in their art. Amazing. Thank you. I'll read Atari's parts. Um, there are more than 6,400 varieties of potatoes in Peru. Varieties are types of potatoes. Only around eight of these types or varieties are grown in the United States. Hi, Serena. In 1536, Spanish conquistadores liked the flavors of the potato and they carried them to Europe. In Europe, the potato helped end the famine, the large period of hunger in many places, including Ireland, Netherlands, Belgium, Prussia, and Poland. The first permanent potato patches in North America were established in 1719 in New Hampshire, New Hampshire by Scottish Irish immigrants. So this is a very summarized uh, version of the potato travels in on the earth. Yikes. Sorry. Today, potatoes are grown almost everywhere in the world. In 2008, a Lebanese farmer dug up a potato that weighed nearly 25 pounds. It was bigger than his head. Potatoes are a superfood. They are loaded with important nutrients like vitamin C, potassium, fiber, and carbohydrates. We talked about how um, the potatoes having vitamin C, which are, is necessary for the growth of development and repair of all body tissues, potassium, which is good for muscles, like our hearts, and helps keep our body's water balance. Potatoes have fiber, which lowers the risk of heart disease, diabetes, and obesity, and carbohydrates, which are a major source of energy for our bodies. So just this in itself is a great reason to have potatoes join us in our travels through space. Now we saw a little bit about um, the potatoes travels around uh, the earth. Um, and now I want to share a little bit of information of the potatoes going to space. In 1995, the potato became the first vegetable to be grown in space. NASA and the University of Wisconsin-Madison created that technology of, to be able to grow potatoes in space with the goal of feeding astronauts on long space trips. And eventually, so that they could feed future space colonies. Much later in 2017, researchers from NASA and the International Potato Center, which is, has headquarters in Peru, started a series of experiments to see if potatoes could grow in Mars and they had encouraging results. Um, Chinese astronauts also sent potatoes as their first crops to be grown on the moon. Hi. Hi Mo. Now, that's our first introduction to potatoes. Now, what do we know about Haumea, this planet that we, the potatoes are going to travel to? The Haumea is, low, is one of the five dwarf planets in our solar system. The others are Ceres, Pluto, 
Make Make, Ear and Ears. Ceres orbits relatively close to the sun in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. The other four dwarf planets are located far from the sun beyond Neptune's orbit. Of these five dwarf planets, Haumea is the least well known. Now, this is the solar system. You see Ceres here closer to Earth, and then all the way to the right, the other four dwarf planets. And the second one, Haumea, our destination. Now, formation. Haumea is part of a group of objects that orbit in the Kuiper belt. In the Kuiper belt, which is this, you can see it on the drawing on the right, there are thousands of miniature icy worlds that formed early in the history of our solar system, about 4.5 billion years ago. These icy rocky bodies are called Kuiper belt objects, trans-Neptunian objects, or Plutoids. Um, structure. The dwarf planet Haumea has an oval shape and astronomers believe it is made of rock with a coating of ice. Size, with a radius of about 385 miles, Haumea is about 1 14th of the radius of Earth. If Earth were the size of the nickel, Haumea would be about as big as a sesame seed. And there's a sesame seed right there. <laughs> Distance, Haumea is located 4,010 million miles away from the sun. This means it takes sunlight six hours to travel from the sun to Haumea. In comparison, it only takes eight minutes for sunlight to get to the earth. That means that it's really, really far away. A day on Haumea lasts only four Earth hours, making it one of the fastest rotating large objects in our solar system. And Haumea also has two moons. One of them is called Namaka, and it's the inner moon, and Hayaka, which is the outer moon. Both of these moons are named for the mythological daughters of Haumea. Haumea is a Hawaiian goddess. Hayaka is a patron goddess of the island of Hawaii and of hula dancers. And Namaka is a water spirit in Hawaiian mythology. Haumea was given the name of a Hawaiian goddess because it was also discovered by um, astronomers and scientists in the Hawaiian um, research center. Oops, I answered my own question. <laughs> Rings, Haumea, is known to have, is the only dwarf planet in the Kuiper belt to have rings. And scientists discovered this in 2017. Do you know of other planets in the solar system that have rings? So some of, I'll answer the question first. Um, these slides that you're seeing here, I should also mention, that are part of the work that we did together with the students. Um, exploration. Everything we know about. Sorry, Serena, I'm having technical. Everything we know about Haumea is from observations with ground based, with ground -based telescopes from around the world. Thank you, Serena. Okay. Now, the next question was, now that we had introduced the potatoes and the planet, why are these potatoes traveling to Haumea? So it was up for um, us as a group and the students to decide why would these potatoes go to Haumea? I also want to mention that as I described Haumea to the participants, to the students, we, I didn't share any pictures of the planet. So the idea was to start building the image of what that planet looked like just from the information that they heard. And then they made drawings of what they thought Haumea would look like. And only at the end did I share these um, GIF of Haumea. 
Uh, this is important because really there are no pictures of Haumea. So all the information that we have is really rendered by artists, just the same as the students and Serena and her peers making drawings of this planet. These are some of the answers that we got. Um, why would potatoes go to space? To experience it, to live there because it looks like a potato, to learn if there are other plants, perhaps new types of potatoes. So the next question was based on the potato shape and what they were going to do in their mission, what do you think their ship should look like? And before starting to draw, we looked at um, form and function in nature. How, does how is shape connected to a reason and how there are different living beings um, that have the shapes that they do based on where they live, what they eat, how they move and what they need. One of our examples was the amazing bat and their ears that can even change shape as they hear different sounds. The other concept that we looked at was biomimicry. Um, how humans have looked at nature for inspiration for many, many times because animals and plants have so much practice doing what they do that they can teach us a lot from their experience. And some of the examples of biomimicry that we saw are trains that are inspired by kingfisher birds. So with these two things in mind, we started to think about what would a spaceship for a potato look like? And here are some of the results. This is a drawing by Atari. Um, Atari was uh, thinking about how made these structures in the bottom so that the ship could land um, on ice. But Atari wasn't sure how thick the ice was going to be. So those structures actually have water to help the ship land um, softer and not depend so much on, on the ice. And then you can see the amazing roots that are coming um, out of the, they're propelled by roots. This is Leo's drawing. Leo made a very elaborate drawing also that had different sections of the ship and the, all of these details were describing how this ship was going to um, kind of detach. Some of the rocket areas were going to be detached throughout the journey. This is a drawing by a Maori. We also did um, drawings of a ship for a potato when the potato was going to travel alone, and also a drawing of a ship for multiple potatoes to travel together. So this is um, a Maori's drawing for multiple potatoes to travel at the same time. It's kind of like a rocket bus. This is a drawing by Sophia. This is a drawing by Johanna. Spacey spaceship. Now this is a drawing by Serena, who's here with us. So I'm hoping Serena, maybe you can share about your drawing yourself. Uh, yeah. So like the pop, the top part of the uh, of the ship, it's meant to look like a, like a potato chip bag, and uh, that's why I made it like squarish because potatoes they can be made into potato chip, potato chips. And then at the bottom, I wanted to make it look like half potato and half potato chip bag. So the bottom is, um, it, it's supposed to look like a potato. And then the stuff at the bottom, those are meant to be roots. roots. And on the inside, in the potato area, I was thinking that they could have dirt and water down there. Or, and that's where they could possibly sleep. If that way they could be in their natural area. And in the top area, I was thinking that they could have sun lamps up there so they can get their natural energy. Amazing. And here is a zoom of that drawing. I love the, the word play, Serena, between the potato ship and the potato chips. It's so smart. Now, this is Serena's uh, spaceship for, um, for a group of potatoes, for many potatoes to travel together. Do you want to share about this drawing, Serena? Um, there, it's basically the same thing as like one potato. Oh, it's the dirt is meant so that they could go into the dirt and just stay there. And uh, I was thinking that multiple potatoes could fit there depending on their size and shape. Okay. And then um, there was meant to be like a staircase that way. And it's kind of big up there that way multiple, that way multiple potatoes 
those can stay. Amazing. I love it. It's like a small environment, like a little world on its own. Perfect for potatoes. Thank you, Serena. Then once all the potatoes had their spaceships, we started to talk about what kind of spacesuit would a potato need or even like. Um, we got this description from uh, NASA and NASA describes a spacesuit that is used during spacewalks. spacewalks. It's actually a miniature spaceship shaped like a human body that protects the astronaut from the dangers of being outside a vehicle while in the space or on the moon. And we looked at um, with a different, whoops, we looked at different um, spacesuits from astronauts from the past, the ones that are going to be used now in future expeditions by NASA, but then also spacesuits that were designed by artists. So how have different people imagined the potato, the, the spacesuit? Now, if the, the spacesuit is shaped like a human body, then what does that mean for a potato? What is the shape of the potato body and how does it change over time? Now, this is important for us because as you remember, Haumea is very far away from Earth. So in that time, the potato could have changed its shape. So we looked at the life cycle of a potato and how it changed throughout time to inform or give us ideas of how our spacesuit could look like. And here are some of the examples. This is Leo's potato spacesuit, a Maori, Atari, Sophia, Serena. Serena, would you like to share about your drawing? Uh, sure. On the left, uh, that's what the outside of the um, spacesuit would look like. I was, I was, because uh, on the ship it says made by PASA, Potato NASA. Uh, so when I was making this, I was thinking maybe like the potato would be the owner of Potato NASA. So I decided to make it look like a suit. Ooh, and then on the inside to the right, I, I decided half of it could be filled with water because potatoes need water to live. And then at the bottom, there's dirt because they need dirt obviously and then air on the left side on the left side of the side of the suit. That's a great idea, Serena. I I didn't hear that before when we were together, but I love the idea of the potatoes starting their own astronaut agency so they can be the bosses of their own space travel. That's a great idea. Um Thank you. Oh, I also wanted to share that we, at the beginning, we made drawings of the humans who were participating in the program, meaning the students, and of the potatoes that were participating in the program. And Serena's potato is called Boily. Is that right, Serena? Now, after we have the spaceship and our spacesuits, we started to talk about the travel. So on our way to Haumea and then on our way back. Um, we did a series of drawings of the potato arriving to Haumea and talked about what would the potatoes find? Uh, what would the planet look like? Um, would they land on the planet or would they just orbit around it? And if they landed on the planet, would they leave the spaceship? Would they find um, um, other potatoes that they were imagining? Or would they, what, were, what would they do once they were finally there? Um, this is a Serena's drawing and now I see it, it's PASA instead of NASA. Amazing. Do you want to talk about your drawing, Serena? Sure. Uh, for Haumea, I was thinking of like a moon design, but I didn't want it to look like the moon at the same time. So I decided to go for like a fading effect. That way it looks like you're closer and the, like there's more light in the middle, but to the outside it's dark. And I was thinking, and I drew like 
a little ramp for the potatoes to walk on um, so they can get down to Hamaya. And for space, I decided to do like a bunch of smudging designs. That way it looks like a bunch of stuff that are, that's like in space. And I decided to draw the ship there where that way, that way they're coming out from the ship. That's awesome. I love that drawing. Thank you, Serena. And I love PASA. You know why, why I'm so excited about the idea of PASA is because part of my interest in, in doing the Space Potato Academy was to think of different ways of space travel, different ways that we can imagine the future. And I thought potatoes would be great companions to imagine both of these things differently, um, more colorfully um, with different uh, missions in mind. So the idea of PASA is perfect. It kind of like brings all of these ex ideas that I had um, in a very clear way. Um, I'm going to write down that. I'm going to write that down for the future, if that's okay with you, Serena. PASA, love it. Um, so then when we were in the planet, we started to think about, the idea was to think about when we came back. It is such a long travel again. So by the time that the potatoes came back on earth, it would be the future here. And the idea was to think about what would the, um, what would the earth look like? And then, for this part of the imaginations, we I wanted to bring together the perspectives of older people in the community and the young voices of the students. So I asked, um, we asked because Miss Paige Thomas helped me and Michael Stevenson as well. Um, they both helped me interview or ask these questions to a group of um, members of the community. The first question that we asked was, what would you choose to share about planet Earth with someone not from this planet? For example, someone in Haumea. And these are some of the answers that we got um, from them. I would share the real story about the way they treat people, the treachery of white supremacy and its social conditions, and the way the world was abused and stolen. I would tell them to please be kind to everybody and not destroy anything because Earth is a wonderful place and we could all get along. If we were to run into some Martians, growing up we were always told that the Martians were coming, I would probably find out what their world is like, ask what they are doing to help preserve their planet. Then the second question is related to that idea of traveling back to Earth. We asked, how did you imagine space travel or the future in general when you were young? And here are some of our answers. Our president, John F. Kennedy, made a speech that we would have a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. Things seemed to move quickly. We got color TV and they started showing Star Trek and other shows in the future of space. Things you just dreamed of were coming to life. As far as space travel, we knew it was coming because that is when you had the missiles and all that. I tell you what we didn't know was coming. It was internet and texting and all that. Um, and then we had another um, quote that I'm missing here. And that was from Miss Ruby. And Miss Ruby shared how when she was little, she saw the Jetsons a lot and every time that she watched the Jetsons she imagined that the future was going to be just like that that there would be driving the people would be driving flying cars and taking the space shuttle to the moon and to other planets we ask this I ask these same questions to the students and even though I don't have the drawings here yet to show you I thought maybe uh, Serena could share a little bit about what you we were talking about yesterday. I remember some levitating um, buildings. So Serena, maybe you can share a little bit about how you imagine the world being like when the potatoes return. Um, I was imagining like them 
they would come back to, to Earth, Earth, and they would be walk, they would be like looking around, and they would just see a bunch of buildings and everything. They it wouldn't be like there would be like no gravity. Everything would just be like floating, floating around, um, and it would. And for you to get up to the buildings, you would have to use. I was thinking that there could be like more like elevators. I don't know, like things that you could use that will lift you up to get into the building since they would be floating. And I was thinking that there would be a lot of things that would just be levitating. Being, and I was thinking with cars, like how you said, how people said before that the cars would be flying, and they would be on the ground. That's how I imagined it. So. Thank you, Serena. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I also wanted to ask uh, older people in the community or older people that are uh, related to, K to doc uh, Dr. King School is because um, I think the imagining of the future is a powerful thing that we can do. And I loved Miss Ruby talking about the Jetsons and how all the things that she describes that she saw on this cartoon are kind of similar and are kind of already happening um, here in some way. So I think that what you are imagining in terms of levitating buildings or flying cars, all of those things could happen, right? So that's why I think it's so important to spend time nurturing a envisioning the future and nurturing different visions of the future, just so that we can have a, a diversity of images that include many, many of us. Um, do you want to add anything, Serena, about the Space Potato Academy that maybe I'm forgetting? Um, I don't think I can think of anything. Okay. I want to thank you, Serena, for being here. Um, and for representing all of your peers. I am so impressed by your artistic skills in your drawings and all of your ideas. So I appreciate everything that you brought to the Space Potato Academy and also here today. Thank you. So now um, maybe Serena and I could answer some questions, if anyone has any questions for us. Thank you so much, Lucia. Oops, my app. Is Thank you, Lisa. Lisa. I, I also, sorry, Lisa, can I quickly interrupt you because I want to say thank you to Miss Thomas for all her incredible support in being able to do this project with the students. I wanna thank Ms. Bree Vance, uh, Mr. Monty, and um, Mr. Kent Ford, Ms. Ruby, and Ms. Uh, Sandy, who all also helped us uh, sharing their stories about the future. And of course, all of the students in the fourth grade class who participated, like Serena. Yes, Serena, we just, I want to thank you also so much for being here and sharing your thoughts and information about your drawings and your imagination of the future. I can't wait for the future to feel just like you described. Um, and I just think that your ideas were so brilliant. Um, so thank you so much for being part of the project with Lucia and um, with your classmates. It was just really wonderful to hear from you. We're so happy that you could join us today. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have a few questions um, that are starting to pop up in the chat. And this question comes from Joey. Joey is asking, did the idea for space potatoes come more from trying to share culture and migration of a food? Or is it more about your interest in space? Or do you feel like it was always a mix or that one came after the other? I love this question, Joey, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, it is a great question. Um, so when I started working on this project with my collaborator, Xin Liu, we really were thinking about um, how the dominant narrative of the future and space exploration is really following Western aesthetics and politics, right? 
why are people who gets to go to space and why they're going to space is really mostly a continuation of colonialism. So when we started to think about how do we think of space more broadly, more diversely with different um, goals and even aesthetics and politics, we wanted to look for um, a messenger for diversity. And we thought potatoes would be a great messenger uh, for diversity because there are so many types of potatoes. They come in all kinds of colors and shapes. So there is no, uh, when one learns more about potatoes, if you hear the word potato, you don't necessarily only see um, one. I at least see many, many um, varieties. Um, so that's the reason why we chose potatoes. But to go back to your question more concretely, I think it was both. I think we went back and forth between being interested in the plants, the history of the potatoes and migration and sharing different cultures and our interest in space. So it's uh, really going back and forth and, and each side of the project is feeding on each other. Thank you, Lucia. Um, I am curious to ask Serena a follow-up question to that. Um, Serena, what was it like the first time you heard about Space Potato Academy and sending potatoes into space? Um, at first, I was kind of just like, um, why are we sending potatoes to space? Because it was, um, it was a little, in my opinion, it was a kind of a bit of a weird project. And then, and then I said, overall, over the time, I started enjoying more of the project. Um, thank you for that. I felt the same way the first time I heard about sending potatoes into space. I was like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard and I love it. Um, and the more that I got to learn about it, um, the more that I've just grown my own knowledge about potatoes and thinking about all of the ways that this can really apply to um, my life in real time. Um, thank you. I have another question here from Tenzin. Tenzin says, I love the various ways you involve the students in brainstorming about the different components of the project and what it might look like. Did you ever come up with your own drawings as well for what you think these different things would look like? You see, I think that's for you. <laughs> Thank you, Tenzing. Um, that is a great question. Uh, the answer is yes, definitely. Um, not as much as I would like. So I still have all these drawings in my head that I need time to get them out. But um, definitely, I, I think I've been very inspired by the conversations that I've been having with the students. And I, as an artist myself, I can't help but think, okay, I would do it this way. So um, yes, I have made some drawings and also have many more to be done. We can't wait to see them. Thank you, Lucia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Lina, there's a question for you. This one comes from Janet Marie. And Janet Marie is asking, what was your favorite part of doing the project? Um, my favorite part of doing the project was maybe drawing Alvea. That was my favorite part because I got to be able to think about what it would look like and everything. I got to brainstorm how it would look and I ended up erasing it like multiple times because I didn't get it right. I, but I just enjoyed the fact that I was able to think about what it could possibly look like. Thank you, Serena. Um, Lucia, this question is for you. Um, you spoke, Jordan would like to know, you, you spoke about involving an older community and getting some comments from those folks. Um, who is older and what are your plans for, for using this in the future? That's a great question. Um, thank you. I, who is older? Um, I think at this point I am older, um, right? <laughs> So I am older than the fourth grade students and, and I have my own uh, interest, I have my own visions of how I imagined the future when I was young. And, and I was interested, okay, let me restructure my answer. I had my own, the way I imagined, space when I was young influenced me starting this project because I didn't imagine it that much. And actually I did, I also watched the Jetsons a lot, <laughs> like Miss Ruby, um, and loved it. Um, 
but when I talk about involving older people in the community, I the answer is I don't know how old they are. Uh, sadly, because of COVID, all of this project has happened virtually. So um, in my dream world, we were joining the same room and we were meeting and interviewing and talking and then at the end, planting our potatoes um, together, our space potatoes, so that they could grow upwards to the sky. So I don't know exactly what age these um, elders are, but they I know they are related to the community and I know they have long term uh, connections to the school and my interest in involving them is to see how um, when we imagine our future, could we connect it to our past as well. So in this uh, idea of imagine diverse futures and diverse uh, expressions of space travel, I think it is important to connect it to cultural heritage, to different um, histories and experiences. So that was uh, my interest in connecting these two age groups in this conversation about the future. Um, for future iterations of a Space Potato Academy, ideally we could meet in person and dedicate more time working on this relationship. Thank you so much, Lucia. Um, Serena, maybe a follow-up question for you in relationship to some of those ideas. Um, I know that you're certainly not old, but when you were even younger than you are right now, did you spend time imagining the future? Is that something that you've done a lot of? Um, actually, now that I think about it, I wasn't really interested in the future. I was mostly just enjoying the the time where we were, I wasn't thinking about like, the past or the future, mostly just like the time when we were, like I was there, not the future or anything, just like the present. Do you find yourself thinking more about the future now after you've been part of the uh, Space Potato Academy? Yeah, now I think I've, I've, I think I've been thinking about the future more often more often than I used to. I would second that. I think about the future a lot more recently than I, than I ever used to. Thank you very much for that. Um, Serena, we have another question for you. So many questions for you. And just so you know, these are coming from some college students that are just really curious and we're really excited to hear you present. This one is from Joey. Uh, Joey says, Serena, as somebody sharing for your class, so what is something you think that your classmates would really want other people to know about the experience of working with an artist, as well as specifically working with Lucia and the Space Potato Academy? Um, I actually don't really know what they would want other people to know. I'm not that close with any of the classmates. Uh, this year, I haven't really been able to talk to any of them um, because I'm not like talking to them in person. I don't really have any time to talk to them. Um, and uh, whenever I do talk to them, they're usually just talking to other people. So I can't really answer that question. That's an excellent answer. <laughs> <laughs> really nice job. Um, I think that we may have a couple of other questions trickle in, but one thing I've really been wondering about um, for you, Lucia, is how the Space Potato Academy has shifted you as an artist and what things you might be thinking about now in relationship to this project, because it's been, you know, it, it didn't just start yesterday. It's been immersive. It's a collaboration. You've done so much work in research. And I'm just curious what it has meant for you to share this work with young people and how it might be expanding your thinking about what's possible now. Thank you, Lisa. That's a great question. I am so inspired by the work um, we've been doing together and I've learned a lot I've had to learn about space in ways that I didn't know um, so if I can answer the question that Serena was asked about how did I imagine the future when I was young or how did I imagine space travel and I I didn't I didn't imagine space travel that much I mean I, I love the Jetsons but I didn't think I would go to space and I wouldn't, um, I wasn't um, 
in that sense, I wasn't looking to learn about space or seeing how rockets work or the planet. So now that I can, that I have an entry point with the potatoes, that the potatoes are kind of carrying me with them on their journey, I am learning more about space and I'm getting excited about what I'm learning. And I, this experience has been amazing because I am so inspired and I have so many ideas of the drawings that I want to make, like Tenzin was asking, and of the how can I expand the booklet? Um, because I had so much fun making the booklets for the students um, with all of the activities and pictures. So, and then ideally, I would like to one day when we are in person, if I am able to repeat this, we could actually build a space suits and the spaceships and then put them on the potatoes and use high altitude balloons to get them out um, on the atmosphere so that we can see the potatoes um, flying. And all of these are our dreams, just imaginations, but hopefully, I mean, that's the point of this, right? So hopefully it will, it will happen. Serena, what do you think about that? Do you want to make, do you want to see the the potatoes in their suits go up in the air in the atmosphere? Uh, I'm, I would like to see that. No, I think that would be cool to watch. I think that would be amazing. I would love to see what your what your potato spacesuit looks like in person. I loved how you I loved how you thought about air and water and soil and everything. You thought about everything it would need to survive and not just to survive but to thrive. And I would love to see what that looked like if you could make it. Um, and hopefully we get a chance to do that one day soon. Um, we have another question in the chat and it's from Ms. Paige Thomas. Paige, would you like to come on and ask or would you like me to? Sure. Um, I have a question for both Serena and Lucia. What was something that was most surprising to you about the Space Potato Academy? So maybe something surprising that you learned or something surprising about the process? I think something surprising about the process for me, I think about the, like the whole thing. I think at first the most surprising thing was that we were doing potatoes and setting them to space. That was just something that was more surprising to me. And I was like, who would ever think of sending potatoes to space? It's like, that was just, that would be like a thought that you think of and then you start investing into. So I thought that was it. I thought it was, it was a surprising idea. But I really liked it. Thank you, Serena. I like that. Um, I think um, I learned a lot hearing from the students. I learned a lot and got inspired by uh, Serena's drawings, for example, or Leo's information about space. Leo taught me a lot about space um, and about nebulas and rockets. So I learned with the students and I don't know if that's a surprise in itself because I I want I'm motivated to work with young people because they teach me a lot but still I think what they taught me was still a surprise so um how creative and smart and open and amazing young people are brilliant geniuses we love them so much um, looks like we have just a final question here, and this comes from Karin. Karin would like to know from both Serena and Lucia, what is your favorite potato recipe? Um, I think my favorite potato recipe would just be boiling potatoes, and I think that's why I named my potato boiling, because I just, I love boiled potatoes. I'm not a big fan of potato chips, but I like them, I'll eat them. I've been same with French fries. I'll eat them, but I'm not a big fan of them anymore because I don't eat them that often. I love that answer, Serena. Because I, you know, I wanted to make a t-shirt that says that had a potato that said, I'm not a French fry, just to say <laughs> to talk about how um, you know, potatoes are so amazing even before they they are made into French fries. So I love your answer. Um my favorite potato recipe, that's a hard one. Um, a, I think causa, which is a Peruvian dish that has 
mashed potatoes that have a little bit of lime and a little bit of chili and they're made into a base and then they there's another layer of avocado and then there's an, a layer of um you can make it with a fish like it can have tuna or shrimp some people make it with chicken this turned into a cooking recipe and then you add a <laughs> another layer of um some people add well it depends the point is that it's a um, layered dish that has potato on the top and on the bottom. Nicholas is asking, what was that, what was that recipe called again? I think like <laughs> it's called causa, C-A-U-S-A. Causa, I think that is a perfect place to, to pause our conversation for today. Um, thank you so very much to you, Lucia, for a beautiful closing lecture in this series and for teaching us so much about where we are, but also where we can go. Um, and Serena, uh, so much, so much love to you. And thank you for sharing all of your ideas and your drawings and um, just for your very honest answers about everything that, that we got to hear about and learn about today. I look forward to being able to hang out with you in person, hopefully next year. Um, and I have some comments in the chat coming from some of our college students. Joey just wants to say, hey, Serena, I want to thank you for your honesty. And Lucia, I've been so appreciating how you are communicating in general. Both of you are so great. Lucia, may I ask if logistically you think this project will have a step after imagination and concept? And Joey would like to know because in part, she has a background in studying earth and space science. And the idea of a launch of potatoes going so, so far is so abstract in their head. So maybe this really is the last question and I think it comes with a lot of gratitude um, from, from Joey here. Lucia, what do you think? Um, so I, I think if I understand the question correctly, this idea of sending potatoes to space is an abstract one. So what do I think is the next step? Like, or do I think there is something beyond just the concept of it? Is that the question? I think so. And I'm, I'm, I'm not certain if maybe Joey may not understand um, that the seeds have actually gone to space. So it might be that they're, so maybe filling out that abstract part for Joey would be helpful. Yes. Um, thank you for your question. And thank you, Lisa. So I'm going to show now a tiny potato. So Unearthing P Futures, the project that Xin Liu and I did in collaboration involved sending um, 75, 95 true potato seeds a, on a mission to the International Space Station. And the seeds stayed in the International Space Station for a month. And then they returned to Earth. Here we had um, other 95 potato seeds that were exactly from the same families that had stayed here on earth. And we started growing them alongside each other. Um, so the potato that I'm showing you right now is one of the potatoes that grew from these seeds that were in space. So yes, it's abstract. <laughs> it's totally abstract. Um, but in a way it's also possible. And other people are sending potatoes to space for other reasons. So I'm interested in that, precisely that, that um, spacing between what's actually happening and what could happen and who gets to be in which side of that um, you know, spectrum. So, so yes, it's abstract. I think it could become concrete. And, and I also think there's a lot of value in just imagining. It. Thank you so much, Lucia. Um, and thank you to you as well, Serena, for being a collaborating artist on the project. Um, this has been an absolutely fantastic experience, I think, for everybody watching. Um, to our Dr. Emma Page and your students joining on the YouTube live channel, we hope that you enjoyed um, hearing from Lucia again and hearing from one of your colleagues at Dr. Emma Page Junior School, Serena. Um, thank you so much to Ms. Paige Thomas for joining us here today and to everybody for their questions and their thoughts. Um, next week, we will look forward to hearing from Paula Wilson for her last lecture in this series. Thank you very much look forward to that. 
that'll be 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time in the same place. So we hope you come back and can hear from, from Paula and see what she's been working on. Um, in the meantime, we wish everybody all the best. We send you all.